evening, everyone, and welcome to Black Literature, Black History. I'm Jason Williams. Tonight, we're going to be discussing a story called The Blues I'm Playing in the Ways of White Folks by Langston Hughes. And we're currently on Chapter 7 in this book. Now, The Blues I'm Playing is based on an event that actually happened in Langston Hughes' life, which he discusses in his autobiography, The Big C. Now, what happened in his life was he was a poet living in Harlem and he met a woman who wanted to be his benefactress or his or his sponsor. She wanted to pay all of his bills, pay for his place to stay, pay for everything so he could spend all of his time focusing on poetry for her. And he did that and he produced poetry and after period of time she stopped sponsoring him because she didn't believe that his poetry was African or black enough. And Langston Hughes said he was too Chicago, too Harlem, too city, and he wasn't African enough to produce the type of poetry that she wanted. So their relationship ended. And I believe her name was Miss Mason, even though he does not mention her name in this story and he doesn't mention her name in his autobiography as well, but it does show up in biographies based on Langston Hughes' life. Now, in the blues I'm playing, the, the artist, she's a pianist, and her name is Osceola Jones. And she has a benefactress or a sponsor, and her name is Miss Ellensworth. Now, Miss Ellensworth sponsors different poets and different artists that she finds and before she finds Osceola Jones the majority of the people that she sponsored were white artists and the story explains that these artists that she sponsors nine times out of ten weren't very good artists because she would actually focus more on people's appearances and their youth more than their artwork. However, she's introduced to Osceola Jones, hear her plays and decides to be her sponsor. Now, as a sponsor, she pays Osceola's rent, pays for all of her bills because Osceola Jones makes her money by having pupils for piano lessons, playing for the church, and doing gigs around Harlem. And Osceola Jones is actually comfortable with her life. She didn't ask Miss Ellensworth for her money. And actually, she gets kind of suspicious when Miss Ellensworth, this white lady who she's never met before, is interested in paying everything for her and so that she could focus on being a piano player. Now, Osceola Jones plays for the church, plays gigs around Harlem. She's a soulful uh, pianist. Miss Ellensworth wants to have her classically trained and play the type of music that she feels that Osceola Jones could use to become great. Osceola Jones accepts her offer because she's a, she is a pianist and she appreciates music, so she does learn the types of songs that Miss Ellensworth wants her to learn. She takes lessons from, from great uh, teachers and great pianists of the time. Uh, Langston Hughes is showing off his knowledge of music through this book when he talks about the different songs that she plays. And I'll name a few here. Okay, and th for example, this paragraph. After tea, Osceola played. She played the Rachmaninoff prelude in G-sharp minor. She played, she played from Liszt, a two days. She played the St. Louis Blues. She played Ravel's Pavan por un Infante Defunte. And she said she had to go. She was playing that night for a dance in Brooklyn for the benefit of the Urban League. And, that, and by reading that paragraph brings me to another subject that um, in, throughout this book, Langston Hughes makes references to things that are prominent in the black community. For example, he's playing in the Urban League now. The Urban League still exists today. Um, a character in here attends Wilberforce College, 
Wilberforce is a HBCU that still exists today. Um, he talks about some uh, when Osceola travels with Miss Ellensworth to, to Paris, and he talks about Osceola playing at Bricktop, and Bricktop is mentioned in his book The Big C in his autobiography because there was actually a place where Langston Hughes used to go to hear an art, a jazz artist named Bricktop play. And there's a discussion in this book about what the artists, when they would all get together, and what they would talk about and their theories and their politics and everything. And Osceola Jones states that the only ones that she felt make, made any sense or were relevant were the artists who supported Marxian views and Marxian politics because they were the only ones interested in getting foods in the mouth of everyone. So Langston Hughes makes those references and everything to show his politics, showing his political views without outright saying he's a Marxist or he's a communist or things of that nature. However, there is a, a audio on the internet about a four hour interview or something with Langston Hughes where he's being interrogated to see if he's a communist or not living in the United States and he cleverly eludes answering that question directly. So, but in this story, Langston Hughes writes a lot of wrongs that he used to see in the Harlem Renaissance. And what he wanted to do in this story was show what a black artist should do in the situations where he or she is being sponsored by a white benefactor, so a white sponsor. So, before I get into that, though, I want to back up a little bit and explain that in this story, Langston Hughes starts the story prior to the Great Depression because he is focused on the Harlem Renaissance, what he calls the Harlem Invasion. And he calls it a Harlem Invasion because what it is is a white person coming down into Harlem to get one of these artists and mold them to do what they believe this artist should be doing. Osceola Jones, like I said, she takes her up on her offer. She does the lessons. And Miss Ellensworth is actually interested in the living conditions of Osceola Jones. And Langston Hughes cleverly displays to us how black people were living during the 1920s. And she goes to the small apartment and she notices that she has a man living with her who she says she's renting the apartment out to, but he's not actually paying any rent. And he's actually is her boyfriend and he's studying to become a medical doctor. Because for some reason in our heads, when we think of the 1920s, because we got their history, they're talking to us about 20s, all they talk to us when they talk about the 20s is the singing, the dancing, the cabarets, the big smiles, the coonery and stuff that goes on, that went on during the 1920s. But they don't tell us about the actual living conditions of black people during the 1920s after the parties, after the cabarets, and after everything. They will go back home to these poor living conditions in Harlem. So, Osceola Jones' boyfriend, he goes off to travel to study his medicine. And during that time period, Osceola Jones travels with Miss Ellensworth. And I say that all black people should travel so you can see different parts of the world. And during this time period, she goes to Paris. This is still prior to the Depression. And that's where she... Osceola Jones practices and she goes out with the black folks and she again I said she plays with brick top so Langston Hughes is showing us that during the 1920s Harlem was the place to be for black folks and Paris was the place to be for black folks and, and those were the two places that he lived in and he discusses the type of lifestyle and the jazz and the art and the blues that was going on 
in both of these big cities. There are some articles that call Paris and Harlem the two capitals during the 1920s. So, in this story, Miss Ellensworth is sponsoring Osceola and Osceola plays for her what she wants, but then Osceola never lets go of her black Negro roots. She continues to play soul music that she puts her heart and soul into, and she can play the classical uplifting music that Miss Ellensworth likes. And that's the point that Langston Hughes wants to make because in the big C, he discusses it plain and simple, not in story form, that in the Harlem invasion, when white people came down and started paying their money to these black artists, these black artists started doing what he called acrobats and all of this stuff that was utterly dull music just to satisfy the white communities and lost touch with the black communities, which happens a lot. That's what happened to hip hop in mainstream. Back in the day, hip hop used to cater to the black community and they would talk to black people. And that's when we had artists like KRS-One, De La Soul, A Tribe Called Quest, X-Clan, uh, EPMD, and many artists who would know that if they got into this genre of music that their supporters were going to be the black community so their music catered to the black community and spoke to the black community and related to the black community. Then once around the 90s, a little bit after Ice Cube left NWA, the greatest consumer of hip hop music from that point on to today is young, young white suburban youth. And now all the rappers want, that want to go platinum, all they talk about sex, drugs, and the violence, not so much violence, but just sex and drugs, sex and drugs and how much money. They don't relate to the black community at all in the mainstream. Now, you can find some that still relate to the black community, but you got to search. Back in the day, you didn't have to search. We knew that on Yo! TV Raps or on Rap City or for a little hour or a half hour that we had, we could turn it on and we were going to see people talking about the community. Now, there's too much sex. There's too much drugs. There's too much nonsense going on. If you don't believe me, name for me two mainstream female artists with the likes of Lauren Hill back when she used to rap or MC Light back when she used to rap. There was even Isis and X-Clan. She used to rap and these women weren't selling sex at all. They were kicking knowledge and they were relating to the community, which they should, even though, you know, sometimes you might have to give up some of your sponsorship so you can relate to your people. That's what Osceola Jones did. She took the money that Miss Ellensworth offered. She took the trips with her. She took the lessons. She played the type of music that Miss Ellensworth liked. But then she, Osceola, decided to get married. She didn't want to leave her people. And then Miss Ellensworth started to lose faith in her, lost interest in her. And the end of the story is very powerful. At the end of the story, we got the uh, stream of consciousness and we got some poetry from Langston Hughes. And I'm going to read to you the end of the story, which is very powerful. And just listen to these words, which they don't really even need explanation because they explain themselves. Okay, at this part of the story, this is when Miss Ellensworth decides that she's going to part with Osceola Jones. Osceola knows this, and she says, can you play for me one last time? And Osceola Jones obliges her. hurt. Okay, chapter five. The Persian vases in the music room were filled with long stem lilies that night when Osceola Jones came down from Harlem for the last time 
to play for Miss Dora Ellsworth. Miss Ellsworth had on a gown of black velvet and a collar of pearls around about her neck. She was very kind and gentle to Osceola as one would be to a child who has done a great wrong but doesn't know any better. But to the black girl from Harlem, she looked very cold and white, and her grand piano seemed like the biggest and heaviest in the world as Osceola sat down to play it with the technique for which Miss Ellsworth had paid. As the rich and aging white woman listened to the great role of Beethoven sonatas and to the sea and moonlight of the chopping nocturnes, as she watched the swaying dark shoulders of Osceola Jones, she began to reproach the girl aloud for running away from art and music, for burying herself in Atlanta and love, love for a man unworthy of lacing up her bootstraps, as Miss Ellsworth put it. So she moved down to Atlanta to marry her boyfriend. You could shake the stairs with your music, Osceola. Depression or no depression, I could make you great, and yet you propose to dig a grave for yourself. Art is bigger than love. I believe you, Miss Ellsworth, said Osceola, not turning away from the piano, but being married won't keep me from making tours or being an artist. Yes, it will, said Miss Ellsworth. He'll take all the music out of you. No, he won't, said Osceola. You don't know, child, said Miss Ellsworth, what men are like. Yes, I do, said Osceola simply, and her fingers began to wander slowly up and down the keyboard, flowing into the soft and lazy syncopation of a Negro blues, a blues that deepened and grew into a rollicking jazz, then into an earth-throbbing rhythm that shook the lilies and the Persian vases of Miss Ellsworth's music room, louder than the voice of the white woman who cried that Osceola was deserting beauty, deserting her real self, deserting her hope and life. The flood of wild syncopation filled the house, then sank into the slow and singing blues with which it had begun. The girl at the piano heard the white woman saying, is this what I spent thousands of dollars to teach you? No, said Osceola simply, this is mine. Listen, how sad and gay it is, blue and happy, laughing and crying, how white like you and black like me, how much like a man and how like a woman, warm as Pete's mouth, these are the blues I'm playing. Miss Ellsworth sat very still in her chair, looking at the lilies trembling delicately, delicately in the priceless Persian vases, while Osceola made the bass notes throb like tom-toms in the, in the earth. Oh, if I could holler, sang the blues. Like a mountain jack, I'd go up on the mountain, sang the blues, and call my baby back. And I, said Miss Ellsworth, rising from her chair, would stand looking at the stars. Yes, and that's what I like. I like the part where it says, the girl at the piano heard the white woman saying, is this what I spent thousands of dollars to teach you? No, said Osceola simply. This is mine. Listen, how sad and gay it is. Blue and happy, laughing and crying. How white like you and black like me. And that is what Langston Hughes wanted to happen with the music in the Harlem Renaissance. And he talks about it a lot in his book called The Big C. He wants black people to be able to play the classical music, be talented enough to go into that music as an artist, but he never wants them to lose their soul, which he explains happens to a few artists. And for anyone watching this video, at the beginning of the story, he says that Miss Ellsworth um, was supposed to sponsor a, here it says, she once turned down a garlic smelling soprano singing girl who a few years later had all the critics in New York at her feet. The girl was so sallow and she really needed a bath or at least a mouthwash on the day when Miss Ellsworth went to hear her sing at an east side settlement house. 
Miss Ellsworth has sent a small check and let it go. Since, however, living to regret bitterly her lack of musical acumen in the face of garlic. I feel that he is actually referencing someone, but I don't know who that artist is. And also another note, um, he talks about uh, Marcus Garvey in this book as well. He mentions him, you know, Marcus Garvey was the uh, Back to Africa movement leader. So this is Black Literature, Black History. The next story that we're going to get into is called Father and Son. So have a nice evening. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh.